Welcome to Mining Over Canada. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners in a first-hand look into our country's vast mining landscape. Hi, my name's Anna Saren. I'm Director of Listings Development with the Canadian Securities Exchange. I am joined today by Kai Hoffman with SOAR Financial. Thank you so much for joining me, Kai. Fantastic. Thanks for inviting me on the program. Thanks for inviting me to Mining Over Canada. So I was just going to say, so we're having this discussion under our special presentation of Mining Over Canada with the CSC, and you and I are going to specifically dive into some stuff that's related to BC Week, because we are having this dialogue uh, during BC Week. Um, but also we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, you know, around the Canadian mining landscape. So there'll be lots of great stuff that will come from this. I'm excited. Um, so why don't we just start off by you telling us about yourself and SOAR Financial. Yeah, pleasure. Th and thanks again for having me on. I appreciate that. And uh, I've been in the mining space for low, over 10 years now, uh, almost 11 years, and uh, started out in Germany working at a boutique. And we, we work with mining companies. And it, I moved here to Vancouver two years ago to be even more immersed in the whole scene. And uh, you can see the background. Unfortunately, the sun comes around right around that time. So I had to close the curtain. Otherwise, you'd be able to see a little more of Vancouver. But I've uh, been in the space for a while. Soar Financial is a group of companies. We have three companies in there. It's uh, Soar Financial Partners, more of a corporate communications firm. Uh, TKNU is a publishing arm, but also Orin Inc. is a data company. So we track all the financings in the Canadian mining space on the CSE, TSXV, and uh, the TSX, of course, as well. So we do have a good overview of what's happening in the space and who's raising money, uh, what does it look like right now, pretty much on a daily basis. Wonderful. Now, you have a bit of a unique um, perspective here. And, and why don't you talk about your background a little bit, because um, you have some great ties outside of the country, but still all specifically focused on an interest level in the junior mining space. Um, so why don't you tell us about that a bit? Well, maybe I have a genetic defunct, right? I'm German, so we've always been close to, to gold and silver. That's always been in our, or as of, because of 1929, the, the inflation bubble there, uh, gold and silver has always been imprinted in our DNA pretty much. So Germans always liked the space. Uh, there's always been a really active retail community in, in, in gold and silver space, particularly. So coming out of Germany, like I know a few funds and investors that look at the space. And of course you have Canada versus Australia. Those are always the two, two battles going on. You got investing either in Canadian companies, they're listed in Canada or on the ASX in Australia. So, and of course, getting that feedback, those are the opportunities. You have the AIM as well, but that's more of a, a tertiary market in my opinion. Like there's some very special projects on there. And uh, Canadian is also a time zone thing coming out of Germany. It's easier to deal with Canadian companies and Canadian time zones and markets than dealing with Australia. Cause I don't, I'm not good at getting up at two, three o'clock in the morning. And when I get up, the, the news has happened and I missed it usually. So that's why I focused more on Canada as well. I think a lot of Germans focus a little more on Canada because of the time zones. A lot of companies are dual listed in, in, in Frankfurt or in the German exchanges as well. So that makes it a little easier and, and the company's more accessible. Okay, so you bring up something that I think is is valuable for people to understand. Um, almost most, um, especially in the mining space, um, companies that I see issuers, whatever exchange they're on in Canada, typically will have a Frankfurt ticker. So can you tell us a little bit about um, what that looks like and why people would have both? Uh, it, it's a bit of the marketing puzzle. It's, it doesn't do much in terms of li liquidity. If, of course, it helps, but oftentimes the spread in, the, the spread in Frankfurt is quite bad or in Germany. Uh, so like I, I barely look at it being German. I, I never really look at the Frankfurt exchange and we do corporate communications into Germany. So I should be tracking that, but I don't care. Like anybody with half a brain buys in Toronto or on the CSE in that regard. So in Canada on the home market, right? Because the spreads are better, volume is usually better. Um, unless you do a big marketing push, you usually don't see too much in Germany, which I'm quite happy with, or unless you're a producer. So that's more of the, the market there. Uh, it, it is a pure retail market, like the hand, the institutions, you can pretty much count on one hand. Um, and for me, an institution already is a family office or a big like fa uh, yeah, family office, high net worth investor is pretty much an institution for me in Germany. And so um, German investors, will they typically invest directly in Canadian um, markets or will they, will they, is, is it an opportunity for them for liquidity to be able to invest directly in Frankfurt? Is that kind of the idea? Uh, well, it, it used to be a fee thing. So the fees used to be quite high to, to invest in Canada. It used to be like 30 euros, which is like 50 bucks a trade. Right. Um, so if you add into that and keep in mind, they're all retail investors, they're investing a thousand euros, maybe 10,000 euros. So if you add 50 euros, it actually adds to your cost base quite significantly. But if you can trade in, in, in Canada or in, in Frankfurt, that used to be cheaper. So it used to be more volume, but the cost for tra per transaction have come down tremendously. I think one group is offering it uh, at a euro or a dollar now per trade. So that's negligible. And even, and even for 30 euros for me, 
you can get way better prices. So, and it's a drop down menu. Germans trade through their online brokers. And uh, they, we don't have the broker system like here in Canada, where you have the, the Haywoods, the GMPs, or the PIs. We don't have those in Germany. We have only direct brokerage. We only have online brokerage accounts. Yeah, I mean, I know historically most people I know that are raising capital for, especially the junior mining space in Canada, um, getting on a plane is is part of part of the course. And and I mean, obviously we have some great investors within our own borders, but I know that that's a big part of practice to be getting on a plane and heading to Europe to raise capital for it. So yeah, prim primarily Switzerland there as well. Like that's where maybe some of the bigger names are. That's where more of the family office money is also hidden. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, there, it used to be very simple to do that. And, but there are a lot of companies that took advantage of that as well. And the Germans, because they're not traveling too much less, they all go to the Yukon to, to camp and hike and everything. But it, it's rare that you see a lot of Germans on site visits. Um, there, there's that bit of disconnect. So they were quite honestly scammed. So the Germans need, or the European, German speaking Europeans need more touching points. So it was always good to go out at least two or three times a year to go Build those relationships and then you can raise money yes there is money available uh europe has been carrying the canadian markets uh through 2019 when it was really bad and especially 2015 when the markets were completely dead that little bit of volume that we saw in in, in canada on the markets was mostly out of germany and, and switzerland actually there's a great story uh one of our big supporters is, is um is Zim2 Capital. And I think they had one of um, their group out of Vancouver, I'm sure you know who they are, but they're a group out of Vancouver who hosts many different junior exploration companies. And and uh, and they Dave Hodge would get a bus and get a bunch of bunch of the guys on the bus and travel around um, Germany and parts of Europe to do road shows. Um, there's, I'm sure some great stories that come out of those trips. I don't wanna I know, know what happened on that bus. <laughs> well, right, what happens on the bus stays on the bus. Um, but yeah. So I know that it's definitely been a big practice to be raising capital over there. Why don't we, why don't we come back to, uh, you know, our own borders here. Um, let's talk about mining in Canada. Why is mining in Canada unique, you know, across the globe? You, you, Canada is so mineral rich. It really comes down to that. It's so well endowed. You'd be stupid to ignore it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's right in our backyard. It's easy. It's a two, three hour drive from Vancouver. You drive six hours north of Toronto or Montreal you're in the richest gold belts in the world, right? Uh, or some of the richest gold belts in the world. So it's it's easy. There's a lot of history. Like, yes, it's, it's just part of the culture, part of nature. It's, it's if you're not involved in mining, it's really interesting. Like when, when you drive maybe from Timmins to Val d'Or, it's almost like meeting your Hollywood stars. Like you, you're here though. It's like when you're in Germany, I know worked in the industry for eight years before I came out here and you, you drive that highway and you see all the big mines, you see the Kirkland Lake mines and everything. And you're like, well, oh, I heard about these before, right? It's like, like I've seen them on TV pretty much. And that's what it felt like. You're meeting those Hollywood stars, but you have them here in your backyard. That's why mining in Canada, it's like the same as Australia to a degree as well, but Canada is, is so special. And it's, it's really accessible most of the times, unless you go way north, for example, but, or in certain areas in the Yukon or BC, um, they're not as accessible maybe, but uh, it's, it's super easy. Well, and I, I've had, um, you know, through this Mining Over Canada initiative, I've had so many great conversations with people across the country. And one of the things that, that is a trend that keeps coming up is, um, you know, obviously, let's be honest here, these are these are very speculative investments, and, and people really need to understand that. I always suggest people, you know, make sure that they're talking to professionals when trying to make these, these decisions, especially in such a speculative sector. Um, one of the things that reduces some of that speculation is um, jurisdiction risk. And I think that's one thing that sets Canada apart a little bit. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and of course, Canada, if you look at the Fraser Institute studies, always ranks very high. I think BC is 20th, which is not bad. It's not one, but it's 20. It's, it's good. There's You have a lot of um, feedback. You're not going to get your property taken away. Um, and, and if that happens, you actually get properly compensated for it. So there's a certain level of security. It's not like in Africa where you have to expect a coup next week in certain countries. So th that gives, of course, investors a lot of confidence. And you, you don't second guess an, an investment typically on that type of risk. There's other political risk in the same category um, that Canada sort of brings to the table. But in general, like it, it's a very safe jurisdiction. There, you just know what you're getting as well. Sometimes it takes a little longer because of processes and, and bureaucracy. But then in the end, if you have a permit in hand, you got it. Nobody will ever take it away from you pretty much. So that that that's what Canada brings to the table. 
Um, we also chatted in our pre-chat, we talked a little bit about some of the regulations in Canada as far as safety and environmental. Um, I think we stand apart a little bit um, around those. And I think we have implemented some fairly stringent standards that um, you talked about kind of the, the valuation of these projects and that's kind of a live in part of it. Um, how does that affect the valuations when, when we just, and we'll talk a bit more micro level valuations, but how does that affect valuations? Well, one topic we've been trending more and more up is in, in the investment community, also funds demanding it more and more is the ESG. Uh, you can't get around it. And of course, Canada is doing a fantastic job at it and you're being held accountable very easily here. Um, coming to, to BC, you have your First Nations, you have the environmental issues that you need to deal with. Mount, Mount Pauly, the dam, uh, the, the dam disaster, there was a wake up call for certain, certain groups and, or, and the government as well. Like maybe we have to add certain other levels of bureaucracy, <laughs> bureaucracy or it's just a, um, a transparency maybe to it as well. Like how do we deal with these issues? And um, th th that, that's been trending and that's why valuations were maybe a little higher. COVID has shown a light on it as well. I've been to one project here already three times in the last six months because it's a two and a half hour drive from Vancouver, right? So it's not like, and I'm not picking on Peru or Chile, but you can't get down there right now. So of course you have an advantage being, being local. Right and supporting local businesses, and uh, that of course shows in the valuation. It's the same in the U.S. to a degree as well. I'm not trying to take away from Canada, but those the U.S. projects come at a premium, and the same as the Canadian projects because you have that safety net sort of built in there. My great uncle and my father um, were both in mining. Um, my dad still is, um, but I the stories I remember of you know back in the day and back 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 in the day they literally would put investors in a bus and drive up to a property. And so the easier it was to actually get to a property, the easier it was to raise capital. And they would uh, another whole bus trip. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's like and then there are companies waiting for due diligence trips from bankers right now, and the bankers can't yeah. fly, right? Yeah. They're waiting for for big debt financings to be signed off more or less, and all it needs is is, is a due diligence site visit, and companies can can't do those right now, which is really frustrating, right? Yeah. So, and that's why like when you have a project in Canada and the US, you can just drive to it. Like yeah. theoretically, you could drive to Toronto. I, I wouldn't want to do it. It's a it's a it's a week long drive, pretty much. But like it, it, you can reach the Golden Triangle from here. You can drive to Stewart. So you, you can do a lot internally within the province or within the provinces that you operate in. Yeah. Well, I was telling you earlier that I had this opportunity to go up to the Clare, one of our issuers, Clarity Gold. I was I had the opportunity to go up to their site. Um, from Langley, we hopped in a helicopter and it was a, we had to, the clouds were bad. So it was about a 45 minute helicopter ride up to the property. Um, but also just the visually be able to fly around the property and see, I think their, their property is over 10,000 hectares. Um, so quite a big, you know, property in the scope of being able to fly around, but they were also pointing out a town called Lillooet, which you can drive to from Vancouver. And from Lillooet, they said it's a 10 minute helicopter ride. So that accessibility, and I think this, you know, this, this pandemic that we're living under, and we're all trying to figure out what this looks like. Um, it, not only are we in a pandemic, but we're also dealing with finally a bit of a, a mining market again, um, which I know people have been waiting patiently for, for some time. And so the, you know, the, the, the two of those coming together, um, it really creates this opportunity where investing within Canada into mining projects in Canada all of a sudden makes it, I think there's an additional benefit to it because you don't have to worry about sending crews off and doing isolation periods and, and kind of managing that side of it or having people out in a jurisdiction where you're not fully aware of their healthcare program or their political ecosystem within all this. So I think- I have the feeling when geologists get a little older, they tend to migrate closer to home. Right. So um, when, when they're younger, they're all wild and they love to go to Africa and <laughs> the jungles of Brazil or something. But now that they're, when, when they're a little more seasoned, maybe smarter or wiser, I don't know, uh, they, they prefer assets and projects closer to home. Right. So that's a really good point. And that means that um, our geologists with the most expertise are sticking close to home and giving us. I'm not sure that's a general rule of thumb, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so let's dive into valuations a little bit, because I think this is a really um, under discussed topic, especially in the mining space. Um, valuations have an incredibly um, important role in companies going public. 
um, in what you should be raising money at, um, what valuation is to raise money at, future valuations, if the value of the property is this much and you go and do this much work and you discover this or you get these results, what is your valuation now? So the valuation is a really important part of this whole process when it comes to investing or being a part of a project in any way, shape or form. Um, so let's talk about it. What is valuating a mining um, asset? Not an easy answer because there are so many factors that go into it. Okay. And I don't have the golden formula for it because in the end, it comes down what does your gut tell you? Does it make sense? Right. Is there enough upside still left on the table when I start investing into this project? So that, that that's one thing. And, and uh, it comes down to due diligence as well. Like who, who's the management team running it? I, I've assigned a premium to a better management team and well known that has done it a couple times before than somebody who's starting out fresh out of university. Right. So that, that also goes factors into valuation. So it's it's not that easy. In the end, it's easy to, to put a valuation around, okay, you got a million ounces, you should be valued at hundred dollars an ounce. That's a hundred million market cap. You're raising money at 80 million. There's a discount, so I should invest theoretically. That's the okay. really simple way, right? But that's that's the uh, that's the very simple one, right? But then there's different nuances to that. How do you exploit how do you value a green a grassroots exploration project? You can't like there no drill hole in the project. How are you going to put a value dollar amount on it? You, you, you can't like there. There's certain, of course, like area golden triangle premium, right? Are you maybe somewhere outside where there's no where you have no neighbors discount, right? And so that that, that makes it a little difficult to value. So there's no general rule for it as so many factors go, go into that. Right? Is it a brown, brownfields project? Has there been a mine on site? Okay, you, you get a premium because you know your metallurgy ideally already, right? And you, you know certain things. You might have some historical reports, some existing drill hole data. And th that all flows into it. Of course, then it comes to political risk, social risk, and, uh, and all those that you factor in. And of course, those are all premiums usually when you invest in Canada. So you, you add another. So Canadian or North American projects usually go at a higher dollar amount per ounce uh, discovered. Um, over the table than let's say other projects further south or in Africa, theoretically, because they have different risk associated with them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. And you you talked earlier a little bit about um, the geography of locations as well. That must come into factor. You said there's certain things that you could just in your own practice take a look at a map and see, you know, certain elements of a project. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's, it's very easy. Like I've done a lot of site visits in my in my life so far, and uh, th th that's the best part. Like the best part of my job actually as well. Maybe that's one of the reasons I love the mining industry. I love to travel. Right now, I feel very claustrophobic. But my point is, you you go to site. It all looks great on paper, right? Presentations are awesome. You can write whatever you want in them. Um, maybe the maps, the, the the cross sections, they all look fine. But then you come to the project, and you see it's at a steep angle. And it's right next to the river. It's maybe a tourist river that a lot of tourists float down on. And, and uh, you're just like, yeah, no, that's not going to become a mine. Like the visual, <laughs> the, just the visual impact itself is going to be a hurdle, yeah. right? So, and that's what you can do. And then for, for the investor who doesn't have the chance to go inside, it's just hop on Google Maps. You can actually look at topography. When one point, I think I'm stealing that point from Brent Cook actually, he says, just take a look. Can they actually put a processing facility on their project? Like, what does it look like? Is the is the river valley they're planning to put this in? Is it even feasible? Like, or is the ang are the angles so bad of the project that you actually can't put anything? And you got to truck it 150 kilometers down the road to find a stretch of land where you can actually do it, right? And that's something as a like in terms of due diligence and valuation that all factors in. And uh, going site visits or using Google Maps or other factors can easily eliminate projects very very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? You bring up a good point. Actually, what is um what is the value on um, historical data? I mean, first of all, let's let's preface this with the fact that we're, we live under a new system now called uh, the National Instrument 43101. And this was implemented in a way to protect shareholders that a qualified person is providing, you know, the information on site. Um, and so when we refer to historical data, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but historical data refers to data collected from a property, whether it was a mine at one point or even just data collected before the 43101 was implemented. Is that correct? Uh, I think it's a general, like, there, I'm not sure exactly what the the timeline on it is like if the company itself has worked on it, it's already historic and you got to validate it okay. so i'm not sure like some some data can be used if it's deemed like you have all the core you have the holes you know where they are they're properly colored you have the gps coordinates so they can be five years old and it would be it would work but that depends a bit on the qp who's writing the reports uh what are they tolerating as well and then it's got to be signed off 
as, as well. But um, th there, there is a difference. Like, A, who has worked on the projects? Was it a big mining company that was working on it because of, right? Or was it just a Dinky Jr. Uh, or maybe four Dinky Juniors that couldn't get anything done? And then you start wondering why couldn't they get anything done? And why should the fifth operator be able to do it? Right. And that's where you got to think again is like, OK, maybe if a, if a smart management take team that you think, OK, they've done it a three, four times in the past, takes over the project. OK, maybe they're onto something. If a junior just options the project just to have something in their portfolio, then you got to think about it was like, OK, this is the fifth company doing it now. Like, yeah, that's a really what's good the thing. point of this. Like and that's the same with Brownfield mine, mine sites as well. Many of them were shut down for a reason. Uh, often quoted is like, oh, the gold price was so low, but back then the costs were very low as well. Like, don't don't forget that as well. Like costs, inflation, and all that. Yes, at three hundred dollar gold, maybe not every mine made money, but the good ones did, and they're still either in existence. So you, there there are certain factors like to, to take into account in terms of historical data that I urged investors to look very very closely at. Like, why does this company have a an edge now, like that's something I ask, and we do interviews with uh, with companies as well. Like, why do you think you're better than, uh, let's say, a Newmont who dropped the project years ago, right? Like, why? And um, where's the edge? New technology might be one, right? Yeah. Like, oh, they haven't they haven't had that C uh, or CSAMT data before, and now we know where to target and vector in closer. Okay, that makes sense. Like, okay, and the the geo is actually a smart person that uh, through third party validation I trust. Then it makes sense. Right. But if somebody comes in, oh, it's like, oh, well, no, we're just going to do this and that. And like, yeah, well, just no, that doesn't sound very convincing. <laughs> right. And no, we're just going to look at it again. And, you know, we're, we're well more experienced. Like, no, guys, you're not. Like, there's yeah. a reason why this hasn't worked out. So that, yeah. that's something investors should look out for. And you can easily ask. And there's so many online Zoom calls and webinars and yeah. conferences where they allow you to ask you questions. Right. It's so easy to, to interact with CEOs right now. Those are the questions you need to ask. Like, what are you doing different if you're working on a brownfield site? Like, why do you think I should invest with you? What do you, what can you do better? And I drifted off there. And yeah, no, <laughs> perfect. Because you actually drifted right into my next question, um, which ties in beautifully with what you just said. And that is, let's talk about due diligence practices, because I think that's a really important thing for people to understand. I think um, being that this is speculative investing, and, and let's just clarify, because you brought this up earlier, there is a very big difference between mining and exploration. Um, and there's some big companies out there that are operational. They have big infrastructure um, and, and you know, the techs and the barracks and all that stuff. But um, a lot of the mining sector within the capital markets is in the junior sector, their exploration um, or, you know, working on pre-feasibility and so on and so forth. So let's, let's talk about due diligence in the junior mining space. As a retail investor, it's very difficult because you, you, uh, you get a lot of window dressing. Right. So if you're a retail investor, you sort of have to believe what the CEO is telling you. So again, so CEO, what is it? People management. Right. So you got to look track record is the first thing. Like I'm a bit tired of saying that people is the is the biggest thing. But when I go to a website of a company I haven't heard of before, first thing I click on is board of directors management. I want to see who, who's involved. If any, any, anybody rings a bell positively, negatively, that already sets the tone for the rest of them looking at. Um, which is really important. Um, as, as a retail investor, you might not have that advantage of knowing who's involved because the players change. Like, and being in Vancouver, you certain after ten years, you certain certainly bump into people again. Either they were successful in the past or not, and you sort of start to recognize names. And one thing I regret doing is not starting a proper database of people um, and uh, their cred credentials. Right, that would have been. A tremendous value, but um, it comes down to people. So due diligence is the, that's the first step. If you, if you know anybody in this street, make make sure call your friend, ask about them. Like, have you heard of this guy? What 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 do you think? If he doesn't have, if he hasn't heard, take on the next part. Like, see if you can cast the white net, get as much information as possible. And uh, it comes down to same with political views. Try to stay unbiased as long as possible. But if you ask three friends and three people are negative on that person, maybe that's not the right company for you to invest in, right? Well, and um, and let's be honest, if there's any success in that person's background, they're going to be put putting it on their literature so it's oh yeah it's going to be the main one and it's but also check and check for gaps in the cv as well check for gaps right like right. make sure it's like oh wait i have heard of that company before like i heard of that ceo before yeah. but he hasn't mentioned that company in his cv hold on like there's something off here right so and why are they doing that like good ceos they don't have to sugarcoat yes mistakes might have been made in the past and if you're a good ceo or if somebody with integrity you just stand above it and say yes i screwed up there uh, I learned my lessons and we're going to do that again. And 
we're going to do it differently this time. And either you're with me for the ride or not, and you believe me, but that's to the person. So, so that, that's that part. Like, it's the most important thing. And then, of course, due diligence comes down, like, uh, what area are you in? Um, like, does it make, is, is it mining friendly? And in, in BC, for example, since we're doing this under the auspices of the BC sort of mining jurisdiction, right? What are the treaties with the First Nations look like? Are they are, are they, are, are they pro-mining? And there's a BC Regional Mining Alliance, which is doing a fantastic job trying to communicate um, the, the viewpoints of the Talton and the Nishka nations, for example, here in BC, right? And there are many other bands that are pro-mining, uh, but those come to the forefront because I know they're involved in that uh, program and the BC government is actively funding that. So. See if, the, if those treaties are handled. Um, does the CEO even address that? Um, I, I think there should always be a slide on that in the presentation as well. Like, what's the situation there? So it comes down to political and social risk again, right? Um, so yeah, due, due diligence in that regard, I think is the easiest. And greenfield exploration, you, you, due diligence, you really have to rely on what the CEO is telling you. Uh, if you're not a geo or an engineer. Um, you, you can check the basics, like I said before, like, oh, where's the project located? Is it next to a river? Is it a salmon bearing stream? Well, that's a negative, right? They might be able to overcome that hurdle because they come up with a unique mining technique or they might use dry stack tailings that could work, but that's that's for something for later down the road. And depending on what your investment horizon is, if you're just looking for a quick flip, yeah, maybe you can invest and actually make some money. And that's the most frustrating thing in the industry as well. You you try to be as diligent as possible and the companies you work with or your companies you invest in, let's say they go up by 100%, but everything else you said, it was like, well, that's not gonna work or uh, it's going up by two or 300% and just outpacing the market, maybe because they're spending a million dollars on marketing, right? So yeah. that's a bit frustrating, especially in a bull market. So usually lifts all, all boats. So, but you got to stick true to your knitting and what you believe in as well. So that, that's what it comes down to. And so you, I, I've you been going get, on and on. <laughs> you brought up, no, I love it. I love it. There's so many good things that are coming from this chat. So people might have to watch this more than once. Um, one thing that did come up in a conversation we had during Ontario week with a woman by the name of Julia Butchar, um, who is a lawyer and deals mainly with these trees between Aboriginal groups and the mining companies is she, she pointed out, it's important to know if these companies have that in place. Um, be very cautious if they don't, or if they're not in the process of working on that, because, um, you know, the, the future of what they're able to accomplish without those treaties in place, should it be affected on Aboriginal land, um, you know, the, the rug can be pulled from them. So as an investor, it's definitely something to consider as part of your due diligence. One of the first things you should actually do when you acquire a project, like yeah. go out to site and meet with all the stakeholders. Doesn't matter if it's First Nations or the local community, engage with the stakeholders. When companies say, oh yeah, we'll have that. The previous company easily had that as well. Like we'll, we'll get that too. It's like, yeah. Why do you? Why are you so sure about that? Have you engaged? Oh, no, no. I'm going to go up there next month. It's like, no, dude, that's too late. Like, at least that leaves a bit of a sour taste. It might not be disqualifying the company from an investment at this point, yeah. but it just, yeah, it leaves a bit of sour taste on the tongue, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing that you brought up was. Um, uh, capital spending. Let's talk about that for a moment. We hear in, in investment terms, something called use of proceeds. What is use of proceeds and what do you look at when you're looking at it? Well, I, I want money to go into the ground, right? So um, that, that's the most important thing. That's what creates shareholder value, right? It's Or, or anything that creates shareholder value. No, no, that's, I, I got to scrap that. You can't say that. So anything that creates value on the ground. So being a drilling, but it also can be surveys or sampling, depending on what stage the company is in, right? And of course, that dictates the terms of the financing as well. But I, what I don't want to see is the company closing a $2 million financing and signing a $500,000 IR contract right after. Um, that's not use of proceeds. But I also don't want to see companies over-raise, meaning raising too much money and parking it in treasuries or treasury bonds for 1%, because that's not a good use of my money. That's not generating value. Right. So use of proceeds, I want to see a clear plan. Okay, this is what we're spending on. I don't know, let's say we're raising two million dollars. I want a million dollars to go in the ground, half a million is GNA for this year, and the rest is maybe just surveys and sampling or staking. That that's fine. And and marketing companies have to do marketing, right? But I don't want to see exorbitant dollars like completely out of proportion go right out of the door once the financing is closed. And unfortunately, I've seen that a bunch of times this year. That's why I'm bringing it up. Well, and I think it, to bring it to a really basic level, when you're watching the Super Bowl and you see an ad for Pepsi, um, how much money did Pepsi have to pay to be up there? So you're absolutely right. Companies do have to go out there and market and they forget, people forget that a company, so you have your, your 
um, exploration project. Um, you're putting money in the ground, you're putting a team on the ground, there's a bunch of infrastructure that needs to be happening. But as a public company, you also have a secondary market and you need to pay attention to that secondary market. Oh, for sure. Yep. You need to create liquidity for your shareholders. You need to be out there telling your story. And there is a cost associated with that. Um, but the practices around that, you know, those should be with integrity as well. You know, like, and companies always have to raise money. Don't forget that we're they're not generating any revenue. So and I'm always surprised when the investors are what you have to raise money. It's like, yeah, we're an exploration company, dude. You know, like we yeah. have to raise money, right? And there needs to be promotion because you want to ideally want to do it at a higher share price. So I'm not against promotion. That's not right. So it's like I run a corporate communications company. I'm not <laughs> against promotion, but it's got to be reasonable, right? And that that's uh it's got to be all be put in perspective. A ten million dollar company shouldn't be spending a million dollars on marketing. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's sort of what I have in my opinion. It, it can create value and you can really create like uh, you can raise a share price. You, ideally, you raise at a higher level, but you got to be careful for it not to drop off. You got to have the news flow to support it as well. Right. So there are instances where a million dollar marketing campaign does make sense because you can raise the, the, the you can raise the market cap and then you raise it maybe the high, twice the share price. Perfect. But then make sure you better make sure that you have some news behind it to support that valuation. Yeah, and not, and that that and not have the share price drop off and look like a Christmas tree chart right after, right? Well, you know, that's yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. One thing that we we talk about as well is, um, and this is very uh, actually this isn't easy to find. I should correct that. It's um we don't have a standardized format for it, but um, capital structure is really important as well. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, oh, imminently important. It's like extremely important, okay. and uh, yes, and uh, you you see companies out there that have 100 million shares out, 50 million warrants and 70, 25 million options. Well, that's 175 million. The warrants are often in the money. So you, the market has to watch out for, for that kind of stuff. So you got to watch out exercise price, uh, expiry terms. So cap structure is extremely important. Of course, the tighter, the better. Uh, Great Bear, for example, is a great example, a very tight share structure. They've always been able to raise at a higher share price, no warrants issued, as clean as a whistle when it comes to that. And of course, they're trading at $16 today. You could have invested 50 cents. When yeah. they announced the first hole, right? And yeah. they've always raised at a higher level. Uh, nobody was left behind, and so th th that's what a higher, what a clear share structure can do for you. Um, yeah. As an investor, yeah, I'm, not, I'm greedy. I want to see warrants, but as a company, I don't want to issue warrants. And uh, like, I'm always on both sides of the table, so I have a hard time when my clients issue warrants because it's like, oh, come on, you're putting a ceiling on 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 your share price, right? And I'm a director of a company as well. We did a financing recently where we had to issue warrants. And because uh, the investors sort of demanded it and you had just like, okay, it's like, well, we're getting money into the door. We can create shareholder value with that money that should take care of that warrant ceiling. And you got to be careful as, as well. Like if you issue too many warrants, you can just put a ceiling on your share price. Without warrants, ideally your share price can run. With the warrants, you have to chew through that block first. Okay, so let's right. touch on that just because um, I think a lot of this stuff might might be new information for people. So let's touch on that. Okay, so when you are raising... Um, these are exploration companies. They have, they have no revenue. So as soon as they complete their drill program, they're going to have to go and raise more money for the next drill program. So they're going to get the results. They're going to say, this is what we want to do next with these results. They're going to have to go and raise more money for that next drill program. So they're going to have to go back to market in a perfect world. Like you brought up Bear Lake. Um, is it Great Bear Lake? Great Bear, just Great Bear great resources. Bear, great bear. They're yeah. great. I love those guys. I know them. Um, so, so ideally, you get good results from your initial program. The results are good. The price is reflective of that. Now, when you go to raise more money, um, it's not diluting the shareholders as much because you're raising at a at a higher level. Um, every time that you do that, it creates what you're talking about is this threshold. So, if all of a sudden I invested at twenty five cents. And now I'm raising capital at 50 cents. There's a support level around 50 cents. When, when you do a private placement, and I would say fairly often warrants and options are being, or warrants are being offered in a, as a sweetener in private placements. Um, what you're referring to is the fact that if I buy $10,000 in a company at a certain amount and they issue warrants, that warrant has an exercise price on it and an expiry date. And those, when we talk about looking at the capital structure, that's really important to understand. So I buy it at 25 cents, there's a new financing at 50 cents, and it has a warrant attached to it at a dollar, which means that company's upside for that period of time is going to hover around that dollar mark. Is that kind of what you're it, saying? Yeah, it, it depends, A, who are you giving the warrant out to? 
if you're just distributing it widely to a wild retail audience, it's, that might be a ceiling for now. Okay. But then again, the company can raise money at a dollar. Let's say they come out with good results and they get to that share price, right? They, let's say they break through that level and they reach a dollar twenty. You'll see those dollar warrants exercised. That's fantastic. That means you're raising money at 100% premium to your previous financing. So there are positives to having the warrants as well. Don't get me wrong. I'm just all negative on it, right? Um, yeah. I'm German. I'm always negative on everything. So, but, um, <laughs> so just take it but, as a German uh, thing, not just... But, the, but there are advantages <laughs> to that as well. So you don't have to go back. Uh, there might be a little less work involved for the for the management team because you don't have to go call everybody calling for dialing for dollars again, right? Because uh, you have the warrants that are being exercised and they might bring in another couple million dollars to, for you to continue in your campaign. Yeah. Maybe, maybe if you had drilled success and while you're drilling, you'd lapse, the results come in, the share price goes to $1.20, you can ex- have those warrants exercised at a dollar, you can, can just continue. So there are advantages to having a warrant as well from the company side, yeah. right? And and the investor sets, gets, gets that upside as well. So if they believe in the story, they get a cheap warrant, which a lot of investors want, obviously, or a long-term warrant. And it's not uncommon to see five-year warrants, unfortunately. Uh, more common is 18 to 24 months. And uh, you, you have another incentive to invest because you get the opportunity to invest at at potentially at a discount again. So, yeah. and and I think the other thing that's important to note about warrants because I think warrants, um, you know, they they have a form and function, and that is <clears throat> you're providing people that are putting money in at a certain level, you're providing them a benefit to remain shareholders <clears throat> and give them the opportunity to participate at a future time at a locked in price. So there's a value there. Um, private placements have a bit of an odd element to them in that you have to be a, an accredited investor to participate. There are a few other um, areas where you can, um, one is the existing shareholder rule. We talk about it in an interview I did with Mark Smith Windsor in Central Canada, which people can go check out. Um, but the, it's also something very much to be aware of if you're buying on the market. So if you're not participating in a private placement with a company and you're just buying on the market, you probably should understand what what warrants are within that company's yeah. capital structure, wouldn't you say? Uh, you got to be careful with the private placements as well because you have a four month hold on those shares, yeah. and you got to watch out when those the, the whole war, uh, the whole period uh, comes off. Um, and depending on the company, the quality of the company, and the quality of investors. Uh, they might be clipping those warrants. Uh, they, they might be clipping the shares or the warrant. That what it means is they sell off, um, ideally the shares at a profit, just to hold that warrant. So they're never really interested in investing in the company. They were just trying to make a quick buck and keep that optionality on their books. So that's something you got to be careful of as well. Yeah, and the so four that's what you got to look out for in terms of exercise price for warrants as well. Uh, ideally, a very transparent company actually has that in their corporate presentation. Otherwise, uh, if not, you got to go on CDAR and dig deeper into the financials or MDNA. I think too, it's important, especially in the exploration sector to understand if you are writing a check to a company, find out what the plans are for the upcoming 12 months, because um, if they are kind of hitting the ground, um, you you might want to um, just understand that timeline that goes alongside with both your warrants and your and your four month hold. Um, you know, are they gonna be active? What what could possibly Ideally, happen? Really, you want news flow to come out when the hold comes off so you can generate yeah. some volume that if shares do get sold, you have a bit of liquidity to soak that up. And I think I think if we kind of take if we if we take all the things we just talked about, there's some real opportunity for investors in the sector. And, um, you know, that's part of why we're doing mining over Canada is to try and educate people on the various ways that there can be some upside. Um, it kind of sounds to me and tell me if I'm wrong here. Management, 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 um, yeah. capital structure and understanding kind of the timeline around that capital structure when warrants are going to be, um, you know, their exercise price and date as well as the four month holds that could be coming up. Um, if you're buying in the market and they just issued 10 million shares that have a four month hold, you might want a time when you're buying in the market around that uh, around that four month hold release date. So there's a bunch of things to understand if you're going to go into it. I always tell people talk to a professional. Um, it's it is so much for a retail investor that doesn't te- have that technical background um, or financial um, you know capital market background to make those decisions. So those are always important. Is there anything as we kind of come to a conclusion here? Is there anything else that you want to give as advice to a potential retail investor looking at the space? Advice like yeah, buy an ETF if you're not comfortable. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Okay. No, not 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 kidding. And uh, this is a high risk space. And as you said, there's so many factors going into this. Uh, find a few sources, and not just one that you rely on, that you think is reliable, and uh, okay. talk to those sources. Subscribe to the newsletters, whatever it is. Um, but make sure you you trust them, and then 
you got to triangulate the information. Like, see if you can get three different sources to sort of confirm it or unconfirm what you're looking for. Don't just look for confirmation bias and people that are sort of thinking the same way. Uh, that's maybe the most important. Like, see if you can find a network or build a network. See if you have anybody in friends or family here in Canada. It's like pretty much everybody's in mining, it seems like. Or anybody, somebody knows somebody in mining or is invested in it. Uh, talk to people and, and f get their views on it. There might not be the most educated views, but the little bit, the most little bit of information can help you build a gut feeling as well. Um, and that's sometimes important too. Uh, I'm, most of my investment decisions are based on gut feelings after I mentally checked off the list, right? So in the end, it comes down to gut feeling and momentum. I don't know. Yeah. So well, that's, and that's I maybe think the best too, advice I can give you. Yeah. And I think too, um, as we talk about different ways that you can, that you can implement into your due diligence practices, have a due diligence practice, have something yeah. <laughs> that you do. Well, there's certainly a list out there on the internet as well, sir. Due diligence. I think Oren Inc. We published one a couple of years ago. There's a list, just go to it, infrastructure. Okay, they got rail, they got power. Do they need power? That's maybe for later stage, but also for earlier stage, like, does it even make sense? I personally invest in projects where I see, okay, this actually can't go into production if we are successful. It has the right added attributes, right? There's a power line right by, there's a there's a highway next door. You can just drive onto it. Like th those are the things like that might make you feel a little more comfortable and depending on your investment horizon are less or more important. And uh, you got to weigh those differently if you're just for in for a flip and I mentioned that before just just do whatever you want but yeah. if you're looking for a longer term investment and uh, i'm not talking 10 years like there's got to be something feasible on the horizon maybe two years or something like that and yeah check those boxes is there a road is there power it has management had previous success we talked about all those factors before so yeah yeah that's great do you have anywhere that you'd point someone that is a resource of yours that you like question just watch there's so much online content right now yeah. um Make sure to just watch like two or three company presentations. Like there's so many outlets. Companies are crazy about going online, right? It's easy. They don't have to travel. Um, and you pointed out like they might be wearing pajama bottoms, right? They don't have to leave, leave the house. <laughs> I watched an interview you did earlier. So you were referencing pajama bottoms. Like it's easy for them to, to put content out, right? And uh, you, you put on a suit. So I'm in the office today, so I'm wearing jeans, right? But uh, if I was at home, I'd probably be wearing shorts today. So, um, but my point is, Find the information. There's a YouTube is a wealth of knowledge. If the companies haven't done a recent interview, uh, and by recent I mean the last two months, like online has just exploded. Yeah. Ask them why they haven't done anything. Look at their news flow. Have they been in the field? Fantastic. Give them cut them some slack. Uh, if not, why? Right. Yeah. There's so much. Like, and I'm I'm sure you can find three interviews. Watch three interviews and watch for nuances as well. Like, how is the meaner changing? Is the guy smiling when he's talking about potential essay results? <laughs> Right. Uh, I prefer live videos than recorded. For example, if you go on a conference, make sure it's live because you can see certain, you pick up certain things. Like we hosted a conference the other day where the CEO just said he came back from Burkina Faso. He's like, oh, why would you go there if it's not important? Right. Because you now have to quarantine. And that wasn't really known in the investor space as well. So if you look at the channels now, the, the, the chatter, the chitter chatter was going on on Twitter and other places. Okay, that makes sense. So they might be coming closer to closing the financing and start construction. Yeah. Right? Those, those those are the things you take away from doing your diligence online. Those are the online events for. There are a lot of them out there. The format you're presenting. Listen to those companies. Check at least two or three presentations. Check for nuances and do that. So wonderful. Well, thank you for all your insights today, Kai. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I hope that you have a chance to get back out there and start traveling around again, that it's always good for us and the Canadian capital market. So I hope we can get you back on a plane soon. Oh, I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait. Honestly, I'm getting close to phobic. So I appreciate you having me on that. And it was a great, great, great talking to you. Thank you again. Take care, Kai.